Hi, I'm Beth. I'm one of the hosts of STEM and 30, a television program for middle school students produced at the National Air and Space Museum. Each episode is jam-packed with student-friendly videos, and best of all, they're free. Our most recent episode came out last month and is all about different kinds of animal flight and how it led to human flight. We encourage you to check it out. Today, we are going to be talking about diplomacy in space, and we encourage you to ask questions, uh, put them in the comment section. We'll get to as many of them as we can live. Uh, also, let us know where you're watching from, and uh, we will try and give you a shout out. We'll get to as many of those as we can as well. I'd like to introduce Brian Odom, who is the acting NASA chief historian. Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you, Beth. Are you ready to talk about diplomacy in space? I'm always ready to talk about diplomacy in space. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with the easiest uh, example, which is the International Space Station. That is that is a truly international uh, adventure. Can you tell us about the different countries that are involved in the International Space Station? Yeah, you bet. First off, yeah, thanks, Beth, for the invitation to to be part of this. And uh, national, you know, National History Day is such an important. Uh, you know, thing that we've been involved in for a very long time. So I definitely appreciate the, uh, the focus on that. But yeah, to your question, uh, the International Space Station, it, it is an, a truly an international venture, right? Uh, you know, it's for for hundreds of years, you know, human humanity has dreamed about going into space, living permanently in some, you know, some, some station, some, you know, just beyond Earth, but, uh, you know, and envisioning what that might look like. Uh, well, when we first started going to space, you know, it was in that Cold War where, it was one nation going to get it against, uh, you know, uh, against another nation, uh, one system of government against another. Uh, but, you know, over the years, what what unfolded is, is as we got closer into the 1980s, when what was called back then Space Station Freedom was first envisioned. You know, there was this idea that, you know, we would invite other nations to participate, that it wouldn't be like, uh, you know, the things the way things had gone during the, the Apollo program. Uh, you know, back in the 60s and late and early 70s, that it would be international. Well, you know, eventually what happens, you know, <laughs> you know, they're moving forward. And in, in the 1990s, you know, 1989, something very important happens. The Berlin Wall uh, comes down in Germany. Uh, in 1991, there's a collapse of, of communism in, in, in the Soviet, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and, so, and so the International Space Station, as we know it today, is kind of born of that process. You know, uh, Japan uh, getting involved very early on. Europe was involved from the beginning. Canada hadn't been involved from the very beginning. But now you could bring on Russia, you know, the Russian program. And we'd had an experience with them before that, that we may talk about. But, you know, this this idea that this would be truly a collaborative uh, adventure that that nations would provide you know, not only for the hardware, for they would come together to think about things in terms of, you know, the way to, you know, the birthing mechanisms is what we call it, you know, the way you would dock a hard, you know, dock these things, you know, build, assemble this thing on orbit, the way you would dock different various spacecraft with it. And we see how important that is now that we are uh, diff with, with different spacecraft. But yeah, truly a, a, an international and that, you know, just the not only from a from a nation's providing hardware, but the astronaut core, right, the different the 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 just the diversity of people that we see on the station just how incredibly important that is both you know participating from a you know from a from a world standpoint and the americans as well so yeah i mean without a doubt that's you know international diplomacy the international space station and its success is a truly important thing to us you talked you mentioned a little bit about the cold war do you want to tell us about the apollo soyuz program because that's that's kind of where a lot of this got started yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, if we think back to, you know, 19, you know, you could go Sputnik versus Explore, you know, or, you know, the first versus the first, you know, Yuri Gagarin, right? He's the first man in uh, in space. And then we follow up with Alan Shepard. So it's these one-on-ones and who's going to get to the moon first, right? But with Apollo Soyuz, you know, the, the end of the Vietnam War, I mean, that was a critical piece of, you know, uh, of the Cold War. Uh, the end of these, you know, in, in, a, in a hope that we could move forward with, you uh, you know, with with mutual uh, work in space, uh, you know, science had for a long time, you know, science, that's the nature of science, right? It's truly a, a borderless field, right? You know, you know, one, you know, we make one step forward and, and, and science moves forward. But the Apollo Soyuz test program was really that first, you know, it was that handshake in space, as you see there in the, in the, in the picture. I mean, it's, you know, these two uh, 
icons of the Cold War from each side, that Apollo capsule. You know, we'd seen this thing re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, bringing back these missions to, from the moon and, 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 and the Soyuz for the, from the, for the Soviet side, you know, but building a system in which they can come together in space. And, and it's just a truly remarkable thing from that diplomacy. And you're right, it's, a, it's the foundation in which, uh, you know, which we build on. It's the first step. And, and I just, a, a quick aside right there, one of my favorite... Uh, uh, photos from the entire you know space program history. I'm a I'm a big uh, Disney World guy, right? So you know, I, I, there's these uh, the photo of the astronauts from the American side and the, and the Soviets meet in uh, Orlando, Florida, you know, in Future Land in Disney World and take a picture with Mickey Mouse. I mean, how how uh, diplomatic is that, right? Did, is that something you would have even seen in, in, in the heyday of the in the in the peak of the Cold War? You know, to see them come together at Disney World and, uh, and hang out with Mickey Mouse, you know, it's just <laughs> it, it's incredible. It, it, the happiest place on earth, right? <laughs> For everyone. <laughs> we got a chance to talk with uh, Soichi Noguchi, uh, who is a Japanese or uh, JAXA astronaut. And uh, we have a short little clip of him talking about uh, diplomacy in space and uh, one of the first meals he made there. Wow, how many hours do I have? <laughs> yeah, definitely you are correct. I was the first uh, mankind to make sushi in space. Well, the sushi is interesting because it has raw fish and also the rice and also have to have a right combination because just adding uh, raw fish and uh, rice doesn't make a good sushi. It have to be a right uh, softness and also the right amount of salt and soy sauce on to the, the raw fish side. So uh, we have a lot of uh, trial and error, uh, how to make a good sushi. And uh, believe me, the JAXA, the space agency, helped me a lot to come up with the sushi plan. So we bring a lot of, uh, you know, the raw fish, freeze-dried uh, raw fish, plus good quality of rice. And we have a great sushi party. Guarantee you, we have a great sushi party. Hi, my name is Soichi Noguchi. I'm a Japanese astronaut. My job is to fly in space and safely come home. International Space Station, as you can see here, this is a small model, but uh, it's a wonderful facility, uh, 400 kilometers above Earth, and uh, we're working 24-7. Right now, there's seven astronauts living over there, do a lot of uh, good science. We believe a uh, multicultural aspect, also uh, diversity plays a huge role on the International Space Station because of this diversity and the inclusion uh, gives us the strength and the resilience to the teams. And this is what we have been doing over the last 20 years. The International Space Station is a great showcase of international friendship. Communication is very important. We have American, Russian, and Japanese living there. So uh, make sure everybody is in sync and understand each other in order to uh, make sure we survive and bring up a good science. And of course, it's for the ice breaking. It's nice to have some uh, humor associated with that to make our days a little bit easier. And finally, Suichi Noguchi bringing up the rear ready to uh, increase the space station science and and get to work i love that video one of my favorite parts of that is all the work that went in to making sushi uh, in space one of the things i love about living in the washington dc area is all the international food restaurants that i get to go to and and eat uh can you tell us a little bit about food diplomacy in space yeah you, you know cultural sharing right uh what a boring world uh you know it would be without that right uh, the, the different types of food i think you know we we've 
Uh, you mentioned Apollo and Soyuz uh, test project back in the you know 1975, and the uh, the American astronauts come in, and the, uh, the the Soviet crew is is there, and they, they shake hands, and as they go throughout the day, they're they're sharing uh, the Soviets are sharing borscht, you know, with the uh, with the American crew, you know. So there's this this swap that goes back and forth. Uh, yeah, there we go. I mean, that's just a <laughs> it's a it's a great it's a great image, right? Because you know, cultural sharing is so important. And something else uh, that was mentioned, you know, this diversity and, and inclusion, right? The the idea of problem solving. If, if there's anything we know for certain about space, is everything in space is complicated. It's complex. It's new, and you need unique solutions, and you need that diversity of backgrounds and thought to really solve those problems. So that's a that's a critical point of international diplomacy and going at these things from you know multiple backgrounds, multiple perspectives. There's the sharing aspect of it, but sharing knowledge and, and the way science works in general, because. You know, as as we go forward, uh, you know, uh, in the in the future, that's that's what we're going to do as, as as humanity. That you know, I, again, to go back to Apollo, you know, when the when the astronauts come back from the moon, it's the we did it aspect of it. You know, and I think uh, you know, there's been a, you know uh, a great work, Teasel Muir Harmony from Air and Space, you know, writes about that. Uh, you know, the post Apollo, you know, after they get back on these missions, they go around these world tours and, and the world comes out and embraces what what humanity has done. And and so that's definitely a great, you know, platform going forward with with diplomacy is that's why you need it. You don't just need it for the sake of soft power or or, or you know, or influence or anything like that. It's 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 a legitimate way, a pragmatic way to solve problems that we're going to encounter. Going to Mars is hard. There's not just an American solution and a, and a Russian solution and a Europe solution. You know, it's, it's it's just not. So, yeah, just just really critical. I want to remind everybody watching, we are taking questions. Be sure to put those in the comment section. Uh, also, if you let us know where you're watching, uh, we will give a shout out. Uh, Brian, we have a question um, <clears throat> about uh, the look of in, in the the changing look of the American astronaut corps uh, in the Apollo program. It was primarily white men. Uh, most, most of them were test pilots. They had a military background, but can you talk a little bit about the changes to the American astronaut corps and how that, that promotes diplomacy and uh, a greater understanding uh, um, among people uh, of different cultures? Yeah, you, you're right. I mean, because, you know, the Mercury 7, definitely, uh, you know, these guys all looked alike. You know, they had to, you know, the the old joke is they had to put them in alphabetical order as, you know, in, in, in as they stood on the stage so you could tell one apart from the other. Uh, that's definitely not, you know, I, I don't think uh, women uh, didn't see themselves there. There was, you know, there's obviously a lot that's been written about that from Dr. Margaret Wiedekamp and, you know, a, a, about that issue. But, yeah, as you go forward with the uh, with the space program into the shuttle era, in 1978, you know, that first class, you know, it's it, it's increasingly diversity, you know, increasingly diverse. Uh, you see women, you, you know, Sally Rod is a part of that group. Uh, Kathy Sullivan, who's doing some great work still, uh, you know, and, and Ron McNair, Guy Bluford. You know, so you're seeing you're seeing a, a diversity. And, and what that really does is that, you know, if we if we're talking about increasing STEM engagement, right, really making kids who look up to who, who can find someone in this core that they look up to. Right. And so there's you know, if it's all white males, well, you know, a lot of African-American uh, young ladies are not going to look at that core and see that that's a future for them. But I think that that 78 class was the beginning of that. And I think now that you get to the Artemis class, you really do see that, you know, that 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 representation of what we really, truly mean by diversity and inclusion. Uh, and, and how important that is to, to solving these problems. Now, and, and, you know, again, not only from a diversity standpoint, from a diversity of background standpoint, you have doctors and you have, you know, payload specialists of the, of the shuttle program, uh, you know, and, and, and just that's just such an important part of it as well. Uh, we have people watching from the Ukraine, uh, from Rich, Richlands, North Carolina, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Kansas City, uh, Missouri. So if you are watching, please let us know where you're watching from and uh, keep those questions coming in. We do have a question about, uh, can you tell us what, are there laws that govern airspace uh, and, and what are those? Yeah, you know, that was one of the interesting problems or, or interesting things that came up in the very beginning of this the space program. 
is, you know, where did uh, international, where did nat national boundaries stop? Uh, so there's, you know, it does it does it go from it into space? Is it in geophysical orbit? Is or is your you have territorial sovereignty there over that? Uh, what that might mean if America lands on the moon first? Do they now proclaim sovereignty over that territory? These are critical issues. Uh, you know, in, in the international geophysical year, you know, Eisenhower dealt with that problem. You know, there were things Eisenhower knew about, you know, the U-2 spy planes and that sort of thing. But what Sputnik really does uh, from a practical standpoint is because the Soviets were first, it, it, it shows that there is a, you know, an international piece of that, that there's a, that there's kind of a, the way they, the, I don't want to get too deep into it, but the way, you know, treaties used to work, you know, the, the oceans were considered to be, you know, mere liberal, right? It was a free seas. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the spirit that God's uh, the outer space treaty of 1967 uh, that, you know, the United Nations uh, puts out and, and it is, it is ratified ultimately and it's been changed over the years, but, but it did kind of, you know, back that up that, that this would be a mission, you know, the outer space exploration would be a mission for all of humanity, for the benefit of all nations, uh, you know, not just the United States and the Soviet Union, but places like, you know, uh, Bolivia would have an interest there. I mean, that, you know, um, the Latin American nations, uh, this, you know, what we refer to as the uh, global south, you know, uh, African nations and, and, and that sort of thing, that this would be a this would be a venture for humanity. So. You know, as part of that outer space treaty that we still recognize as being the guiding force for for space law today, uh, it just it changes for, to some in some areas. But you know, the moon and other celestial bodies are you know exclusively for peaceful purposes. So again, that's the spirit that guides the the legal frameworks here, uh, and and it and it does continue to do that. And and, and not only you know uh, some of the big pieces of of this is you know commercial space, right? And we don't want to get too deep up into the weeds on that. But, you know, what if if a representative of the United States goes and does something uh, as far as extraction goes, what, what's governing that? And, in, in, you know, in terms of contamination, uh, debris that we put into space, you know, orbital debris is an important issue. So, you know, we really have to think, be very thoughtful about how that unfolds. And that's a, that's a diplomacy because we have to have a mutual shared vision for what you know, how this process is going to unfold. And that's that's what the Outer Space Treaty continues to give us today. Well, we've got people tuning in from Terre Haute, uh, Indiana, Winchester, Virginia, New Jersey. And SOTV STEM is a NASA museum and informal alliance. And they are tuning in from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, thank you all for watching. Keep those questions coming. Another thing that uh, is on top of the international uh, community's minds these days is climate change. Do you want to talk a little bit about how space exploration affects a worldwide climate change effort? Yeah, you know, the data that's gathered by NASA and its, you know, international partners and international, you know, the, the nations that are that are doing this, you know, looking at remote sensing data, looking back at Earth, you know, since the, uh, you know, beginning of the environmental movement and, you know, the, the initial Earth Day and, you know, the 1970s and the age that that was, you know, we've given a lot more thought to, you know, what is the impact that we're having on the planet and how do we monitor the health of the planet? And obviously the health of the planet is not a national concern. It's an international concern. Uh, and I think the, you know, today we're still continuing uh, to do that. And, and it's, you know, getting climate change data and understanding really what's happening uh, through the monitoring of, of the oceans, uh, the temperatures in the oceans, the you know, the loss of ice, the, you know, the, the you know, we all remember, well, a lot of us don't, weren't, weren't around back then, but the, uh, you know, the hole in the ozone layer and things like that, how, how we understand that. So, you know, there's a lot of work that goes on on the International Space Station today uh, in satellites that, uh, you know, that are observing as well to really look back home and see, you know, what it is that's going on here. Uh, there's another piece of that too, you know, uh, there's some, you know, we used to talk about things, uh, you know, uh, uh, nations who don't participate directly in this. How do we put data into the hands of people at a village level in a place like, you know, uh, Cambodia or, or, or Guatemala to make uh, decisions, real time decisions about the environments that they inhabit? Right. So maybe not about climate change, but things like algae bloom. Right. Uh, and how to control how to get information about that. Uh, and there's a program I can just mention that NASA Severe program. And, you know, they have hubs throughout the world, you know, in Latin America, in the Mekong Delta, in, in East and West Africa, 
you know, where they they work with people at a real village level to talk about issues like deforestation and the impact that it has uh, to talk about how th these things really do impact uh, the health of agriculture, you know, to, to figure out how to distribute water across crops. Uh, you know, so so NASA is heavily involved in that. And that is a, that is a piece of diplomacy as well. Right. Because, you know, how do we do that and, and what tools do we need for that? So, you know, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Climate change is a big piece of this. But learning to live and operate in a world where science is the data from science is shared uh, to help people make those decisions. If you're watching this video and you like it, be sure to share uh, and keep those questions coming in. We have a few more minutes. Uh, Brian, I have a question uh, here about um, how has international uh, cooperation and in, in, in space changed the way things like satellites, mm -hmm. uh, um, spacecraft vehicles, how, how is how has that changed over the years because of the information from an international collaborative? Well, from an engineering standpoint, right, there's there's lessons learned. Uh, what lessons have been learned in one program around the world that that we don't have to learn again? Right. We share the information. We share the experiences. We share the we, we share the paths forward with each other. And, and that goes back to that diversity of thought. So it's had a big impact on engineering. Uh, getting to space is is hard. Uh, it's not any easier now than it was in 1961, 1957. You know, it's it's still very, very hard. Uh, so the more sharing we have from an engineering side, the better. Uh, when it comes to things like, uh, you know, what, one recent thing that, I, that is probably on folks' mind is the, you know, the James Webb Tele Space Telescope. Uh, that that observatory is going to tell us, answer questions about the universe and about the, the origins of the universe and that, that, you know, we may not even conceive of now. Missions like that wouldn't be possible without this international cooperation. Uh, and if you see how that mission played out, right, the science behind it, the development of the instrumentation since 2003 uh, for that mission. Uh, if you if everybody pay, you know, if you were paying attention there, it didn't launch from KSC. Right. And it didn't launch from Florida. It launched from, uh, you know, French Guiana. Right. It's uh, on, a, on, a, on an Ariane uh, 5 launch vehicle. Uh, so, you know, this is incredible participation. And in fact, Europe's going to be involved in, in some of the science of the processing science. And and obviously, when you're talking science, you know, you have scientists around the world who are going to look at this data and, and, and really answer those hard questions about how was the universe? You know, how did it begin? Uh, Webb will help us with that. So. So, yeah, it, it has had a huge impact. It has a huge impact on the on the number of questions we can ask how we ask those questions and what missions we develop to, to answer those questions. And I, that, that leads sort of into another question that's come through and it's um, who gets to decide where different countries can set up human habitations when we get to the moon? That's a, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's definitely uh, something that uh, we, we hope that we go back to the outer space treaty we, you know, there's no, there will be no, we recognize there'll be no sovereign uh, territory there, but how, how do groups interact with each other? I can tell you one, one other, uh, not to, not to change the topic whatsoever, but, you know, we think from a history side, we think about historic preservation, uh, you know, the landing sites for the Apollo program. Um, what, what is it that's going to govern, uh, you know, the, the preservation of those sites? You know, we have three lunar rovers on the, on the moon. We have a lot of instrumentation there. Are those historically, uh, you know, valuable places? So, you know, it, it, once, you know, and, and the big question obviously is resources. Once you begin to find something of value, that changes the, that changes the paradigm completely. And, uh, and hopefully we will be able to go forward under these principles that we're there for human, uh, you know, for, for the, for the benefit of all mankind, uh, humanity, not mankind, see, that's an outdated term too. Uh, you know, so, so that we, we, we really are thinking about these things proactively. So, you know, because you don't really want to see, you know, space become militarized. You don't want to see space become a competition. And, and, and we hope that those philosophical uh, pieces will back that up. So that's a great question, though. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, following in on that question, um, how has international cooperation become a model for NASA's upcoming Artemis? missions which are which are going to go to the moon so 
You got it. Yeah. The, the Artemis program, you know, that's, uh, you know, NASA's plan to go to return to the moon, to learn to live there sustainably, learn hard lessons, uh, and then and then going to Mars, right, for, for deeper exploration of places where we haven't gone before. So, yeah, you're, you're right. It, it, exactly. That picture there, the uh, the SLS, or, or not a picture, I guess, because that <laughs> it hasn't flown yet, but the Space Launch System, that's the vehicle the, that's going to that's gonna take us back to the moon. But but you're right. The International Space Station really does inform this discussion. It, there's there's something out there, the Artemis Accords, right? Uh, nations are already participating in this uh, in this program. Uh, the, you know, there's there's a, there's a ton of them. But the Artemis Accords, while they're not legally binding, they are agreements that people can sign on to to be a participant. I know somebody you mentioned somebody's on from the Ukraine. I know you the Ukraine is a signatory to to that those Artemis Accords. So it, it definitely is an Apollo Part Two. Uh, that's not what this is. This is not a let's beat somebody to the moon. You know, we've already gone to the moon. Uh, we're going back to the moon now for specific reasons to, to learn a sustainable existence off the Earth's surface. That's going to take that diversity and inclusion of thought. And that's what really is driving the Artemis uh, uh, program going forward. Brian, thank you so much. We are out of time. Uh, I appreciate all the answers to our difficult questions that we had. Um, and thank you for joining us again uh, for National History Day. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> Before we go, there are a couple things that I do want to mention to you. Um, <clears throat> don't forget to check out the latest episode of STEM and 30, which is uh, all about bugs, bats, and birds, and even a couple of brothers, two in particular. It features Chris Kratt, who you might know from Wild Wild Kratts. Also check out uh, <clears throat> the episode of STEM and 30 we produced last year for National History Day. It dives into doing research with primary sources and has some hints on how you can help future historians. Also, <clears throat> We want to let you know that starting in May, you can catch our Air and Space live chats exclusively on YouTube Live. We'll be on Facebook through April, but only on YouTube starting in May. So tune into YouTube. And right now would be a really good time to subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this program, be sure to follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter. We always enjoy hearing your feedback, and you can email us at stemin30 at si.edu. And thanks so much for watching today.